I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about executive orders from the president, and which are part of the way the president can control regulatory agencies and the federal government. Here we're talking about mostly two specific executive orders, 12291 and 12866. These are the two that are typically studied in an administrative law course or a statutory interpretation or legislation and regulation class um, in law school. And they had a lot of impact on the uh, structure and process of regulatory agencies and how agencies um, are allowed to make rules. So let's look at what happened. And we're, I'm going to start with just a little bit of background about executive orders generally. And the, the first thing to know is that there's actually no official or legal definition of an executive order as opposed to a proclamation or directive or presidential memoranda or something like that. Um, every White House puts out all of these things, proclamations, directives, executive orders, and so forth. Um, they might follow slightly different processes for each one. Usually an executive order says executive order across the top. And executive orders have been numbered sequentially since FDR's term during the New Deal. He was doing a lot of these and they decided to start tracking them. And what they did to come up with a number is they went backwards and started with Lincoln for number one. So executive order number one is from Lincoln. And as will be obvious when, as we proceed, by the time we get to President Reagan's presidency in the 80s, we're up to the 12,000s to give an idea of how many of these there are. FDR himself issued um, around 1,500 executive orders, while Harry Truman, his successor, issued only about 250. But remember, the latter was not in the White House nearly as long as uh, Roosevelt was. And also, he had a bad experience with an executive order in the Youngstown tube and steel case that you may have studied in your constitutional law class, the Supreme Court ruled against him. And after that, he did not issue as many executive orders. Just by way of procedures, this is usually not taught that or emphasized that heavily in administrative law or leg reg courses. But um, keep in mind that an executive order can kind of come from anywhere in the executive branch. It could come from the president himself or his staff um, or the office of White House counsel. Um, it could come from cabinet members or even within an agency. And they will go to the OMB or OIRA for review. I'll explain that in a moment. And, um, and then from there, the proposal will for the new executive order will typically go to the Department of Justice and be assigned to an assistant attorney general who will uh, write a memo and check checking for legal issues and constitutional concerns and things like that. Assuming it's all approved, it will be signed by the president, and then they are published in the Federal Register. Now, are they reviewable? Not really, not most of the time. Most executive orders create no private rights or causes of action and are therefore not typically judicially reviewable or enforceable by courts. Um, so if you don't like an executive order, you probably aren't going to be able to bring a challenge to it. There's a few exceptions, right? R rare exceptions where an executive order is implementing a spe very specific um, congressional mandate that was codified in a statute, uh, for example, to adopt a certain policy by a certain deadline or something like that. And so at that point, we can um, uh, have this. The so the executive order itself is typically not reviewable. The presidential action that is carried out through the executive order may be reviewable as in Youngstown Tube and Steel, uh, where he was, uh, President Truman was seizing the steel mills um, to uh, break a strike during the um, war years. So uh, most of executive orders even include a disclaimer saying they do not create any private rise, uh, rights or causes of action, sort of like boilerplate. Um, and most of these are not terribly interesting. A lot of them address internal operational guidelines within the executive branch or chain of command issues or uh, try to uh, make agencies uh, coordinate their activities with each other and so forth. Um, once in a while, you get an executive order like the two that we're going to talk about that are very consequential and get more media attention and um, attention from law professors and lawyers. And so that brings us to Re President Reagan executive order 12291. And this is a really big deal. Um, this uh, brought a major structural change to the regulatory state in our country and may 
uh, by some measures, be the most consequential part of Reagan's uh, domestic agenda legacy. He's mostly remembered for his foreign policy during the uh, uh, waning years of the Cold War. But in terms of his domestic policy, apart from his his tax innovations, um, the, this was one of the biggest changes to the federal regulatory state or federal agencies since the New Deal. And so the Executive Order 12291 required that um, we would regulate, agencies could regulate only where Right. The regulatory benefits would outweigh the costs, and by costs we typically mean uh, compliance costs by the uh, regulated industry. So you had to show that um, benefits uh, outweighed the costs, and the and if there were various regulatory options, you had to pick the one that minimized the net costs um, for the regulated industry. In other words, before agencies can promulgate a rule um, through informal or formal rulemaking, they have to submit a comprehensive cost benefit analysis, um, explaining the benefits and kind of turning it into dollars and comparing that with what the expected or projected cost will be for, the, uh, for complying with this regulation. And they cannot move forward unless they do this. And they, the, the other part of 12291 was it sort of repurposed this, what before that was a not terribly significant um, little division within the White House called the Office of Management and Budget or OMB and gave the OMB approval power um, over all proposed rules within the executive branch. And so an agency, that's where they submit their, um, their cost benefit analysis when they wanna promulgate a new regulation. And um, within the OMB, there's an office that's um, 30 or 40 people basically, um, that's called the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs or OIRA. And they're the ones that specifically interact with agencies about their regulations. Most proposed regulations from agencies are not approved the first time around. OIRA will uh, um, come back to them and tell them that they want some suggested changes made. And so the people, the directors of the OMB and OIRA are presidential appointees who go through Senate confirmation, and they have a lot of influence over the implementation of presidential policy now. And sort of in, in some ways, the OMB sits atop the entire uh, federal regulatory apparatus. Um, and there's many things for which the agencies have to get OMB approval. Uh, now, Clinton came along in the early 90s and tweaked to this a little bit with Executive Order 12866. Um, and again, for most administrative law classes or uh, legislation and regulation classes, these are the only two executive orders that you'll actually need, kind of need to recognize by number. Um, so Clinton didn't uh, do away with this Reagan uh, framework. Instead, he retained it. He retained cost-benefit analysis requirements for regulation, new agency regulations, but he added some qualifiers and deadlines. And so in the Reagan era, um, if there was a, an agency like the EPA that was sort of out of favor with the White House, sometimes they would just ignore their submissions for months or even in one case, a couple of years at a time um, and not approve their proposed regulations. And so uh, with Clinton's changes, if an agency never hears back from OIRA or the OMB, after a certain um, number of weeks, they can just proceed and can basically take it as an acquiescence. Um, and uh, Clinton's executive order allows for the OMB to consider um, uh, incentives for innovation and distributive impacts, equity, and so forth. So it expanded the review for any proposed rule um, uh, that could significantly hurt the environment or public health, safety, or diminish the rights of individuals receiving government entitlements, grants, or loans. In other words, we're not just comparing um, bottom line, like the costs versus the, the payoffs and dollar amounts, we're allowed to look at some other um, basically policy concerns like protecting the environment, um, public health concerns, and the rights of impoverished individuals. Now, 
Uh, subsequent presidents, we've had a lot of presidents since Clinton, obviously, um, have kept this framework and they've made minor adjustments, but the overall framework consider, continues to this day. The OMB and OIRA conducts review of most proposed re new regulations from executive agencies based on um, really um, comprehensive cost benefit analysis. And they will usually ask agencies to make some changes before uh, giving approval final approval. And that concludes our little overview of executive orders uh, from the president.